Welcome to another Hunt and Fool review video. We have come to Wisconsin here to get it straight from the source. Austin and Jessica here from the Hunt and Fool, and we have Mark Boardman and Mike McDowell from Vortex Optics here in the podcast room, ready to show us an in-depth breakdown of a 10 by 42 binocular. Is that fair to start with, Mike? That is absolutely fair, since all of these binoculars are indeed 1042s. But they all look different. They do. They, uh, you can see that, well, a little bit different colors, a um, little bit different sizes, and probably the most uh, critical thing is different levels of glass quality. So, so when I'm shopping for a 10 by 42, it's, that's not enough information to know where I need to be, right? Right. Now, we're going to talk mostly about 10 by 42s, but I think we should probably define uh, what the numbers actually mean. So uh, maybe you don't want a 10 by 42, you find out after doing a little shopping, but it is one of the most popular combinations of the first number being magnification, the second number being the diameter of the objective lens lenses. So when you look at a 10 by 42, uh, 10 is how many times larger things are magnified or how many times closer you are. It's the same thing. It's synonymous. Um, and then the objective lenses are 42 millimeters in diameter. So all of these are 10 power. They make things look 10 times closer. And they all have an objective lens that's 42 millimeters in diameter. Okay. So to go through the names to be sure that we're clearly talking about exactly what everybody's looking at. We've got the Crossfire starting at the bottom or the most budget friendly. We've got the Crossfire, the Diamondback, the Viper HD, the Razor HD, and the Razor Ultra HD. That, did I say I'm right, yeah. Mark? You nailed it. I mean, you really pointed out a big thing, and I think it's going to be one of the primary things we talk about today. They're all 10 by 42s. It's a deep lineup of, op deep lineup of optics coming in at different price points. Yep. On the surface, they sound the same. Oh, they're all 10 by 42s. What am I getting? You know, at Vortex, we try to offer, you know, a, a price and performance level uh, at several tiers to yep. fit a person's needs. But it can be a little bit difficult when you're looking at it and breaking down, well, what am I getting when I buy a Diamondback? What am I getting when I get a, get a Viper or step it up to the Razor UHD? And, and that is the, uh, the question I will commonly get, whether in an email or on the phone or with a showroom customer. Um, they'll read the specifications for the various binoculars, and to a lot of people, they, it sounds, they all sound the same. So yeah. they, they, what, how can you differentiate them? What are you getting? Well, the, the thing that you're primarily getting, you're getting build quality, but it's the glass quality, and, and that's everything about the binocular. There are actually three blocks or components in a binocular. There's the objective block or objective lenses that gather the light, in the middle of the barrel, there's the prism block, that's glass, and then in the eyepiece or ocular, that's a series of glass lenses. So the quality of that glass to allow more efficient light transmission, that's what you're paying for. Now, the, I like, there's a fun thing I like to do when I have a customer uh, in the showroom. I first show them each binocular uh, graduating up to the next level. I'll say, take a look at the crossfire, all right? Appreciate something outside, and when you're done, look at the same thing with the Diamondback, and then go to the Viper, go to the Razor HD, and then go to the Razor UHD. And I will ask them, did you see much difference as you went up? And they'll say, well, a little bit. Then I'll take them from the UHD and bring them all the way back down to the crossfire. I said, now look in the crossfire. They go, oh, now I really see the difference. Okay. So going up model to model line, you don't really notice the difference on a huge level, but when you jump from the, the intro to the high end, then you really see what you're getting. Hmm. And there are subtle things that comprise the, the optical presentation um, that you can look for, you can teach people what to look for, why they might want one over the other. Better field flatness, better brightness, better resolution at distance, all kinds, there's a whole bunch of criteria. Things that are not online, things that are not in the manual, things that you can sometimes only learn about by talking to a, a sales rep or something, a tech guy. Now, one thing I'm curious about, can how I see through binoculars be different for me than for you? Absolutely. So okay. our personal vision does play a role in how good we perceive these optics to be. Okay. It is um, quite true that for some uh, users, 
they may not, even jumping from one extreme to the other, discern that much of an improvement mm -hmm. in optical quality. It could be just a matter of their, their vision. Um, and that works both ways. Sometimes somebody with lousy vision benefits by going to the more expensive binocular. On the other hand, there are some people whose vision is such that it doesn't really pay to go to the high-end binocular because it, they're not going to see any better. It all depends on the type of vision that that individual has, whether or not it's going to be worth it for them. Um, thing I like to tell people is, is um, you know, spend at the top of your budget because you are going to get something. Mm -hmm. There's something objectively you're going to be getting for your money. Sure. You know, uh, not everybody wants to spend $1,000 on a pair of binoculars, but maybe they can spend, you know, 200 something or 500 something. So there's, there's room, I think, for everybody here, um, and it's just a matter of budgeting and how good you want to see, because that's what you're primarily paying for is the field presentation. Now, we deal with a lot of Western hunters that mm -hmm. are concerned with weight mm -hmm. is always a big deal and light transmission, mm -hmm. or we say, I want to see in the gray light. I want to see early mm -hmm. morning, and I want to see late at night. Mm -hmm. Tell me how that works. Can I see in the gray light? If I spend more money, do I get more light transmission? Do I see mm -hmm. more? Can I see earlier? Or is that all kind of a myth? No, it's not a myth. It's, it's absolutely true. And uh, one commonality all five of these binoculars will also have is um, the exit pupil, which is the diameter of the shaft of light that comes out of the eyepiece that can enter into your pupillary opening. And it's calculated just by taking the aperture, mm -hmm. 42, and dividing it by 10. So the, di the exit pupil diameter of all of these binoculars is 4.2 millimeters. Mm -hmm. I think, well, they must all be, have the same brightness then if that shaft of light on each and every one of these. But think of it like lanes of traffic where there are more cars coming down some of them than others and the cars are photon, photons of light. So if you have a binocular that has higher density glass that allows light to transmit more efficiently through it, you have more information going down those little 4.2 millimeter wide channels that are getting into your eye. But in low light, your pupillary opening is going to go boop, your pupils are going to dilate. So you can let that exit pupil into your eyeball. In bright light, your pupils uh, constrict and it doesn't make as much of a difference to have that, that optical quality. You're hmm. always going to benefit, even in day bright light, you're always going to have the benefit of the more expensive binoculars giving you better resolution at distance. Okay, but the low light part um, even though they all have the same magnification, aperture, and exit pupil, the more expensive optics are going to buy you more time at dawn and dusk. And the question is, follow-up question is, well, how much time? Yeah. It's not a lot. <laughs> it's, it's, not a lot. It's, it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes from one extreme to the other. And hunting, that can matter, though. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of times that, that block of time is the critical mm -hmm. time frame. So I have a question. Um, just aesthetically, I can say that the UHDs are... Are, are bigger in, mm -hmm. in their overall appearance. What part, you broke this down into three different sections, what part are you investing in more to create this larger? Yeah, if you, if you look at these binoculars from the uh, underside, you can see that these ones are shaped more like a capital letter H, right? Where these ones kind of go off like that. Mm -hmm. All four of these binoculars have a prism design called the schmidt Pecken prism. And this is the odd one out. It has something called an abiconic prism in it, which is a differently shaped prism that's more elongated and, and bent than the prism blocks in these binoculars, which are shaped more like a, a square with a little gable end on it. Roof prism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the shape of the prism block, the prisms in this binocular dictate the shape of the binocular. And the abiconic prism system is a more efficient prism it has fewer reflections and refractions in it, and that increases light transmission, which is why this is more expensive and does better. <laughs> so, Mark, what do you use? What is your go-to? You're going west. You're going to Alaska. Where do these fit in for you? You know, I've run most of them in varying capacities. You know, I guess I'm you know, fortunate here, kind of get my pick of the litter. So I ran the Razor HDs for a really, really long time. Loved them. I mean, they were doing everything I need them to do. Then I looked through a pair of UHDs. And so now I predominantly run a 10 by a 10 by 42 or the 12 by 50, which we don't have here, uh, UHDs, depending on the hunt. That said, the Razor HDs do have that size weight advantage. You know, the form factor, 
between these two binoculars is, is pretty different. You know, this, this bino here is coming in like, I don't know, about 25 ounces ish, maybe something like that. Probably. You know, this one is, is, is a little bit more and a little bit bigger. Um, if I was going to go truly light, light, light fast, if I was really trying to shave, you know, ounces, grams, you know, whatever game you're trying to play, maybe I might sacrifice some optical quality and go with the 10 by 42 razor. But generally I find I'm going to go with, with the UHD for what I want to do just because I do appreciate looking through them for extended periods of time, periods of time whether you're hunting mule deer or coos deer or even blacktails. I glass a, I glass a ton, you know, hunting blacktail deer in western Washington as well, trying to pick apart clear cuts, yeah. things like that. And just the, the resolution, optical quality, color fidelity. Um, it's just, I mean, it's truly, the, the UHDs truly are, you know, a top tier alpha class binocular. And, and I have grown accustomed to a certain standard of living, Mike. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, this is the one that I probably gravitate towards. Yeah, and, and that's, that's a, an interesting point is, is that once you have gotten used to a certain level of optical quality, if you do have other binoculars in your collection, like I, I have a few binoculars, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's difficult sometimes to go down and, you know, if, if like, oh, yeah, you know, this, I really want to bring the UHD, it's 1042 or maybe a 1050, but it is kind of, it's kind of heavy. But then, you know, when you go down in some of your other binoculars, like you're losing glass quality and sometimes the compromise just isn't worth it. And you think, gosh, what if I do run into some situation or some animal or something? I want to see it as good as I can. I want to make sure I'm getting the right identification. So I hardly ever do that. I usually bring a 1050 or an 8x42, eight, eight mm -hmm. depending on what I'm doing. So, But usually I only bring one binocular. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will say, like, even though it's like, okay, yeah, I'm saying, oh, the UHDs, get the UHDs, you know, they're also a chunk of change. And I think it's important to point out as you go up in quality, it's kind of like a, you hit a point of diminishing returns. You're paying a Absolutely. lot more for less of an Good incremental word. increase mm -hmm. in optical quality. So, man, I think for a lot of folks, you know, including myself before I worked at Vortex, there's that sweet middle ground where you're getting a ton of performance for your dollar. You know, Some you're Viper. making huge leaps Viper. like that Viper mm -hmm. HD. Um, man, that's a, heck of, that's a heck of a binocular, and, you know, it's, yeah. not, it's not killing you in your pocketbook. Yeah. I think it's important to point out that no matter what you're doing Western hunting wise, you can mount all of these on a tripod, mm -hmm. which is going to mm -hmm. change your world in the glassing game, just stabilizing it. And me personally, I'm more of a diamond back in the truck, you know, always there, always readily accessible, might get a little beat up, you know, in the mm -hmm. center console. But when I get out of the truck in my bino harness, I'm running. UHDs mm -hmm. just all the way through. But mm -hmm. I've found the value in it. That's my bino of choice, and I love them. You know, we, and Mike, we have, you know, all 10 by 42s out here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, in essence, just to really kind of compare apples to apples, but what are some things that you can do to maybe, you know, maybe what happens to your optical, optical quality in certain instances when maybe you do go to a 12 by 50? Are you getting something with the 12 by 50 that maybe can be enhanced by having that greater magnification just outside of the magnification itself? Yeah. Um, this might sound like a contrarian thing, but there's another optical um, index called twilight factor that I don't know if you've ever heard of or not. It's the square root, the product of the magnification multiplied by the aperture. I've you definitely put never that up heard on the screen. <laughs> yeah, it was my understanding there would be no math <laughs> during this portion of the debate. Now, night. what you do if you run that math, you'll find out that though, let's say you had a 1050 and a 1250, uh -huh. the 1050 has the larger exit pupil. Right away, you think, uh, well, that's going to be the brighter one. More light, yeah. Kind of. The image will appear brighter, but if you do the math on twilight factor, which which what that tells you is is how good is the contrast going to be in low light. After you do the formula, you run it against a 1250 and a 1050. The 1250 has the slightly higher number. Really? Well, it makes sense. If you have 12 by f times 50, mm -hmm. what's the square root of that? You're going to get a bigger number than 10 times 50. Right. And it's been scientifically demonstrated, science, who knows, right, <laughs> that the binocular with the higher twilight factor enhances contrast better in low light. Mm. So if your game, to borrow Mark's phrase, I love that, is to detect movement in shrubbery in low light, Yeah. The larger uh, twilight factor is sometimes the way to go, okay? Not necessarily the exit pupil. Still, the five millimeter exit pupil, same glass, of course, right, is gonna have a little bit better brightness, 
but it might look less contrasty than the 12 by 50. So detecting movement in a 12 by 50 in low light is probably going to be a little easier than a 10 by 50. Now, Mark knew that. He just didn't know what it was called. <laughs> I, was, I, was, yeah. I was baiting you into it, Mike. And, I think, and you made a, 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 a distinction there, too, like all things being equal. So yep. when you're talking sure. about that, you're talking about it within the context of all UHDs. All, right. all razors, all, all Viper HDs, yeah. you know, when you're comparing like the, the twilight factor of the 1250 yeah. or the 1050. For example, if, if you were to take the twilight factor of these two binoculars, it's going to come out to be the same, but that doesn't mean they perform the same. Mm -hmm. sure. Just like they all have the same exit pupil because of 1042. It's only a useful value when comparing like to like glass. That's very interesting. I mean, now we're talking like, yes, it's technical and complex, but that's a relevant for coos deer hunters oh, sure. or glassing mm -hmm. in thick brush or shrubs like you said that's all going to play Absolutely. into the game of glassing detecting movement yeah. stabilizing your binoculars and i appreciate you showing us these oh. and i hopefully that helps somebody who's shopping for a 10 by 42 decide where i fit what i can afford and is it worth it for me absolutely, absolutely.